Welcome to the Geek Freaks Podcast. Before we get started, make sure to hit the subscribe button on Spotify and Apple Podcast and any other podcast listening platforms you may be tuning in from. On today's episode of the Insurance Hot Seat, we have Brian Semra, a full-time digital forensics investigator and part-time information security specialist for small and medium-sized businesses. The Insurance Hot Seat. Hello, Brian. How are you? I'm good. How are you? You know, I can't complain too much. It's sun is shining. We're in October. Not a lot of leaves have dropped off the trees here in Michigan, so I'll take it right now. <laughs> I hear you on that. So, being the industry expert with um, digital forensics investigators, um, kind of tell me about what you do, how you do it, and uh, then we'll jump into the, the, the meat of it. Sure. Well, you know, when you're talking about forensics of any kind, you're you're basically looking at something where it is um, trying to find something that's already happened, right? Trying to find evidence of that. Um, when you're talking about a digital forensics, you're talking about something that's happened electronically um, or on a digital device. So that comes into play a lot of times these days with breaches when we're talking about digital forensics incident response. So... Um, you know, if, if you get breached or something, especially, you know, if you're insurance, if you're in the health industry, um, payment card, anything like that, it, it's not enough just to say, hey, I've been breached. You have to know what was exposed. Um, and a lot of times that can actually help you because the potential of what could have been exposed prior to investigating and seeing exactly what happened is much greater a lot of times than what actually did get exposed. So being able to come in and say, hey, Here's how they got in. Here's what they got. Uh, it, it can be very helpful, not just from a peace of mind perspective, but also just from limiting exposure and potential risk to your company as well. So I guess the, the in layman's terms, it's the detective, right? So if an actual home robbery mm-hmm. happens, you are the detective that comes on the scene to kind of figure out why, how, what they got. You know, maybe they stole the TV, but in your case, it's mm-hmm. data, right? So... Yeah. I think it's a an overlooked, valued a- asset that a lot of companies, you know, they realize, hey, I got 30 years worth of CRM data, but they don't realize how much that's worth to other people. And Exactly. And the problem is, you know, you may know that somebody got in, but unlike a home robbery or a physical robbery where it's pretty obvious what was taken, when you're talking about something digital, unless it's something like ransomware where the data is modified in some way, it's going to be hard to figure out what exactly happened without having somebody like me come in and, and help you out with that. Yeah, and I think that's uh, a, a really good thing to understand is that you don't know what's taken, right? Because the file can still exist there, and they're just copying it, or they're mm-hmm. just moving data from here to there, and there's really no track or trail or trace until it hits the Internet or, you know, there's a, a, a Social Security number that's leaked that's coming from your leak or whatever the case is. So, yeah, I mean, it's very important to do, and I think people overlook it. And as you as a third party, you get brought in on special cases, I assume, or is there retainers, or how does that work? Yeah, it depends. Um, so we also do upfront security, so we'll help with, you know, if, if a company has uh, has had an incident in the past, we're more than happy to help them figure out what happened and all that, but then we can also help them secure their infrastructure from the beginning. And, of course, there's no such thing as 100% security. So I'm not going to say that, you know, by using us, you would never get hacked. But at the same time, it, it severely limits the um, the likelihood of that and the exposure that would happen if you did get hacked. Because if you have the proper controls in place, ideally there's not going to be much movement once they get into something. They're pretty much just going to be there. Well, and I think else. that's overlooked too, right, is that, People can buy all the antivirus, all the firewalls, all everything, right? And if nothing is 100% foolproof, there's always a lot of environmental things that could happen. The end user or maybe the updates didn't happen or they didn't get applied or the firmware didn't get applied and now you're exposed. Mm-hmm. And I think it kind of takes, you know, from our role, we're kind of the custodians of that, right? Is that we have to do the right things. We have to ensure the right policies and procedures are put in place. But it's only mm-hmm. going to work is if the end users adhere to those rules. So that's where people like you come in that say, okay, well, there was an accident. It's time to clean, clean it up and figure out what happened. Yep. Well, that's where defense and death comes in, too. I mean, you know, there, there's a huge fascination these days, it seems, with antivirus. But in reality, antivirus should be your absolute last line of defense. I mean, 
we basically treat it, if one of our customers has an antivirus detection, we treat that as if it's been a full breach, and we do a full DFIR investigation to figure out how it got in to that point, because it should have been caught earlier. You know, and, and we'll then adjust defenses later to, to accommodate that so that we know that it doesn't happen in the future. You know, we stop it before it gets to the end point at that point. And that's another thing that people don't really tend to think about is that payload. How is it getting in? Why did it get in? Mm-hmm. Did we type something in wrong? Did we hit the wrong domain? Uh, yep. You know, why didn't the DNS filtering catch it? Why didn't the firewall catch it? Why didn't it stop at the edge? You, you just, there's not a lot of thought put into that process because when it hits the fan, it hits the fan, right? So everybody's in panic yep. mode, catch up mode, trying to clean up all the messes that's that are happening. And I think, you know, the very last piece of it is the actual what happened, right? And that goes mm-hmm. overlooked in a lot of this. So it's important that companies like you guys exist because it helps us understand, helps providers understand what the hell's going on. Yep. So from your aspect, um, a lot of our customers and a lot of our listeners are small, medium businesses. Do you got anything that you see in the marketplace right now or anything that's going on in the world that we should be on the lookout for or maybe things, uh, you know, fishing attempts or anything that, that, you know, any little nuggets that we should kind of keep our eye out on for them? Yeah, I mean, there's, it's, it's changing day to day. I mean, you know, what's, what's valid now might be completely different in an hour. Um, but, you know, one of the trends that we're kind of seeing right now is that the um, where the major attacks are happening aren't even on clients. So, to speak, they're, they're against managed service providers and IT companies, um, or even internal IT departments for larger enterprises. And the reason is because once you get into one of those guys, you've got access to all their clients, you know, because everybody's got their RMMs out there, you know, the remote management software, they've got um, remote access through Screen Connect or, you know, whatever remote software they're using. And once you get into one of those, you know, even if it's a basic technician account or a help desk account, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless at that point. Um, so the you know, Fed's the just released things? a bulletin about that, too. I think that was released yeah. last week or the yeah. week before about about for yeah. providers like us, uh, you know, not having the maturity as, or security posture, I guess I would say, in what they're doing. You see a lot yeah. of it in the forums of, like, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty active in a lot of the MSP communities, and the, mm-hmm. some of the larger ones got hit because they didn't have 2FA turned on, on their um, – yeah. Uh, antivirus actually it was delivered through a, yeah. a web route, but um, yeah. well, and, and I had a, an amazing conversation the other day with somebody where I was just astounded. I mean, uh, this was on a, a forum page for one of the major remote management and monitoring tools, and this RMM had basically decided we're going to enforce that two factors turned on for all of our clients, which of course is a really good thing, and it's a really good thing that they should have been doing before, um, and I'm really happy to see that they're moving in that direction. But there was a guy on there who was saying, hey, what's going on with this new access thing? You know, I can't get in. And so I jump into help mode, you know, I'm trying to help him out. I'm like, hey, you know, did your two-factor code get lost, or, you know, what's going on? And the more I talked with him, the more it became evident he had never even used two-factor on anything in his life. He didn't know what it was. Um, you know, and, and, you know, maybe he's not one of the top-level technicians, and that's fine. But just the fact that somebody that has access to an RMM doesn't know what two-factor is. I mean, you really do have to make sure that your computer guy isn't just somebody, you know, Joe Blow off the street who kind of knows computers. You know, you have to make sure that they're actually doing it properly and you get what you pay for. Well, and I think a lot of the uh, MSPs or ISPs or whatever are, are scared shits right now, right? Is because now we're mm-hmm. we're the threat point. Now we're the ones yeah. that have we do. We have the keys to a lot of castles, and we have to make sure they're protected. Like we use a third party tool to track passwords that's not connected to our RM, and we don't save passwords in our RM. Like we have to do the right things mm-hmm. to, to ensure that nothing happens down the road. And I think for a long time that wasn't a very big spot or a very big thought in our heads was like, we have to do the right things on our end as we're telling our yep. customers, Hey, have good passwords, have complex passwords, change your passwords, use two off. And then we're using two off, but are we changing our passwords? There's a lot of things, you know, in the last 18 months, 19 months, two years that we had to really look inward on as we started to roll out our policies is like, okay, well we're saying this, but we got to eat our own dog food. Right. And I don't think a yeah. lot of providers want to do that because it's the same right. thing that you see probably with customers is, Stricter security, the right security is not convenient for anyone, but that's the mm-hmm. point of it. No. Yeah, you have to find that, that balance because at some point, if you make it too hard, users are going to try to start to circumvent it. And when that happens, you have to figure out, okay, 
how can we make this so it's not blocking to our users, but at the same time, still secure? Um, you know, and for instance, you know, forced password changes, that's one of the big ones. Um, NIST actually recommends against it now. Um, you know, but for years, we always told people, you know, change your password regularly, you know, or in many cases, we force them to. Um, and, you know, nowadays, we're seeing that two-factor is a more effective way rather than constantly changing passwords. And, of course, two-factor isn't a silver bullet. You know, it's not, it's not something that's going to stop anything and everything. There are still ways to bypass two-factor. Um, you know, for instance, if you're using a cell phone, you know, and, and text-based two-factor, um, somebody can do it's called SIM clone, which is a trick your phone company and it's basically transferring your phone service to their own phone. Um, you know, that's one of the more extremes. The other thing is session hijacking. Um, because when you're using your computer and you're logged into a site, it gives you a session token, which is valid, you know, for however long the site sets. It's, if you hit remember me, it could be for days, for weeks, for months. And once somebody gets that token, they can get in without your two-factor code because as far as the site is aware, they are you. Um, you know, and that's an area where we've, we've been looking at a lot of the RMMs. Um, you know, Ninja had an issue that's long ago where there was a major announced breach of an MSP where they got in through the session tokens. Um, so they're able to completely bypass two-factor. Um, there was another RMM recently, and I can't say who yet because uh, they're still fixing the issue, but um, we found a session issue on their system and filed a responsible disclosure. And we're like, hey, you know, there's this issue where, you know, you're not handling sessions properly, so it makes it easier somebody to ever get this token, and it exasperates the issue even further. Um, so, you know, it could be a vulnerability on the RMM site. It could just be an issue where, you know, your computer was exposed to malware or something like that, and instead of going after passwords, they went after session tokens. And that's crazy because it's, I mean, as you're talking about Ninja, you're talking about, you know, a fairly small RMM in comparison to some of the larger ones. But then you see like Microsoft making a lot of changes to their security postures and what they want us to do yeah. and how we need to do things. And, you know, we have to use Microsoft Authenticator because I have a admin account for our partners and mm -hmm. that's a powerful password to have. So now I have to use their Authenticator and, you know, that's fine. It's great. I, it's, it's good. But it, like, it's weird to me to think that six months ago that wasn't a thing and now everybody's seeing kind of behind the curtain on how we work and what we control and how we have to manage all this stuff where it's now like, okay, yep. now the bigs are forcing us to do things that should have been done in a long time. But now we have the, now they have the capabilities of doing it before it was a pain yep. in the butt to turn on to form factor for three accounts, but they found a magical way to do it. And it was great. Yep. Yep. Do you see, if you had to have a crystal ball, do you see this getting any better? Do you see it getting worse? Uh, what's kind of what's your, you know, crystal ball I, prediction? I think it's going to get a lot worse, but eventually it will get better. Um, one of the big things is it's now in the public eye. You know, whereas ten years ago, you know, you start talking about hackers and crackers, and you're you're, you're picturing these nerdy guys, you know, with the hoodie on and you know, holding something up to a, a payphone, you know, to to freak it, you know, or to this dial tone and gets you into somebody's modem or something like that. But these days, it's uh, it's a lot more out there. Privacy and security are both um, at the forefront of people's minds these days, I think. Uh, so especially when we're talking about legislation that's coming out, you know, we saw in Europe, GDPR is a huge um, step forward in privacy. I don't think it's uh, it's, it's by any means a, a, you know the, the best thing that could have happened, but, you know, it's better than what was there before. Um you know, because with privacy, a lot of times comes security controls. They're not necessarily synonymous, but um, a lot of times they go hand in hand. So I think these days, um, you know, the legislation in the U.S. is going to be coming forward a lot more where they're going to start coming up with things where, you know, we have more statutory issues where if somebody does cause a breach, well, they're, they're more liable for it. And it's not just going to be something they can pass off to their insurance to deal with. You know, if they have cyber insurance, that's great. But, you know, it needs to be something a little bit more than just, oh, my insurance will cover it, you know, just a slap on the wrist type of thing. The scariest thing to me, too, is uh, negligence is a, like, it can void your cybersecurity policy. And negligence mm -hmm. and anything is to be like, I didn't change my passwords. I didn't do, yep. you know, the, 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 I guess the, the, the right thing, I want to say, for lack of better terms, in the front end, that they can then say, yeah, you had a breach and it, your $1.4 million policy doesn't pay out because you didn't do the right thing. Yeah. And I think a lot of businesses overlook that. 
Yeah, especially with doctor's offices. I mean, you know, you look at a lot of these, especially independent doctors, you know, they're like, well, I, I don't want to deal with HIPAA. You know, my, you know, I think that in their minds, it's not if I get a lawsuit, it's when I'm going to get a lawsuit because of medical malpractice. But, so then they transition that and they apply that to the cyber area as well. And so they think, oh, well, you know, if I get HIPAA fine, my insurance will cover it. And worst case scenario, I'll just go bankrupt or something like that, you know, and I'll, you know, just sell off my practice. But in reality, that's not how that works. You know, you're, those those issues are going to follow you no matter where you go. And it's getting to the point where I think insurance is getting smart and they're not covering a lot of these things when there is this gross negligence going on. And I think that uh, even... So we we work with a lot of insurance companies and ranging in size from like three to you know eighty people is our largest, and on mm-hmm. any level, whether they have three employees or they have eighty employees, they have to they, we have to help them build this posture and they have to be ready for the changes that are coming. Yeah. I mean, we've been working our tails off to try to figure out a way to roll all this out in a, in a former fashion. But uh, yeah. b- before I get you off, do you have any tips, tricks, anything we can get out here to the listeners about keeping their tails safe in this environment? Well, you know, one of the big things is uh, take a look at Have I Been Pwned. Um, that's Have I, uh, letter I, uh, Ben, B-E-N, Pwned, P-W-N-E-D, dot com. Um, that's a site run by Troy Hunt. Uh, it's a fantastic site to be able to see um, if your password or your email or anything has been found in known breaches. Um, and there's a lot of technical stuff that goes into making sure that that site isn't going to cause a breach in itself when you check your password there. Um, I can go into the, all the technical details, but I think suffice it to say it's been really thought out and it's, that is one of the few places where I would actually say go check your password, go check your email, um, and see what information is out there about you. Oh, and that's, um, you know, not every, go, sorry, and that's been, we just got a, not last, but last year we got a lot of emails with people's old passwords in them and mm-hmm. because they were on that website. So not yeah, because, and, not because, but we use that website to check against it to say, well, yeah, you're yeah. in the Adobe hack in 2008 or whatever it was, your yeah. password got leaked well, and you use the same password. So that's why it looks so familiar to you. Yep. Yeah. Well, and the crazy part is, you know, you, you look at um, some of these breaches, I mean, they're, they're years old. I mean, the LinkedIn breach, I think was 2011 and it's still one of the most popular um, password lists out there that they'll try. And people are still using their, their LinkedIn password from 2011. Yeah. Two factor. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, well, Brian, it, before I get you off the phone here, is there, where, how can my, you know, how can the listeners get a hold of you or where can they find you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it a website, Twitter, anything like that? Um, yep. Yeah, best place to go to would be uh, infosecchicago.com. That's I N F O S E C Chicago.com. Perfect. As always, Brian, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I know it was very insightful for me. I love hearing it. And it's, I know it's a hot topic today. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good day. Thanks.